American F-4 Phantoms streak into North Vietnam. It's time for revenge. Enemy MiG fighters have been tearing apart U.S. bombers. Now, legendary ace Robin Olds has set an intricate trap to lure the elusive MiGs into one-on-one -on -one air combat. It's the most elaborate sting in aviation history, codenamed Operation Bolo. Using state-of-the-art computer graphics, you're in the cockpit as the hard-hitting F-4 Phantom takes on the fierce MiG-21 in the biggest aerial battle the war has yet seen, a deadly air ambush. Experience the battle, dissect the tactics, relive the dogfights. January 2nd, 1967, Colonel Robin Olds, veteran fighter pilot and renowned double ace, leads a flight of four Air Force F-4 Phantoms on a mission over North Vietnam. For months, North Vietnamese pilots have wreaked havoc on American bombers with guerrilla hit-and-run tactics. Now, it's time for revenge. Olds devises an intricate trap to lure unsuspecting MiGs into a fight. He disguises his agile fighters to mimic slow and vulnerable bombers. As the pilots approach the enemy airfields, a thick cloud cover obscures the target area where they expect to find the MiGs. I went past the target for a couple of minutes, did a 180 and came back. Olds circles, hoping the MiGs will take the bait. I knew they were airborne but they were underneath us and going the other way. So I went further past their airfield by time and distance and did another 180. Suddenly, MiGs emerge through the clouds. They've taken the bait. One streaks in on old six o'clock, directly behind him. Captain Everett Rasper, Piloting a nearby Phantom spots the tailing MiG and radios a warning to Olds. I looked over and I saw the MiG pop up out of the clouds right behind him. And I, I called him by call sign and I told him there was a, a MiG back there. Olds orders his flight to do a defensive split, breaking into elements of two jets each. But the MiG sticks to Olds. Olds and his wingman are here. The MiG is here. Olds three and four man here must do something to protect their leader. Captain Walter Redeker, piloting the number four Phantom, acts quickly. He throttles up into a steep climbing turn called a high yo-yo. In the high yo-yo, Redeker levels his wings, pulls up, and gains altitude. As he comes over the top, he's inverted, looking down at the MiG. He turns toward the enemy, staying above and behind. Then he dives at the MiG. The goal, come down behind the MiG-21, in position for a missile shot. He slides in behind the MiG on Old's tail and fires. Mortally wounded, the North Vietnamese jet spins out of control and disappears in the low clouds. One MiG is down, but more burst through the clouds. The fight is on. The elaborate sting known as Operation Bolo is quickly growing into the biggest aerial engagement of the Vietnam War. For months, American aircraft had fallen prey to North Vietnamese SAMs, anti-aircraft artillery, and MiG pilots. Bolo is a chance to even the score. Two years earlier, on March 2, 1965, the United States had kicked off Operation Rolling Thunder. The objective? Destroy North Vietnamese base and air defenses, smash bridges, roads, and railways, choke the flow of men and supplies down the Ho Chi Minh Trail, get the North to abandon support of the Viet Cong rebels in the South. But Washington has placed restrictions on the American airmen. 
The simple answer to destroying the MiG force was to destroy the bases where the MiGs flew from. At this time, the airfields were off limits because killing the Russian advisors at these airfields risked a wider war. The only way to destroy them then was only after they were in the air. Even the approach to a target was dictated by Washington. You had to go down a corridor. So where do you suppose they put all their guns? I was told that the North Vietnamese possessed more anti-aircraft weapons in a 40 to 50 mile radius of Hanoi than Germany had possessed in all of Europe in War II. So the opposition from guns, missiles, and MiGs was uh, quite impressive. Losses mounted. Among the hardest hit were fighter bombers, like the F-105 Thunder Chief, known affectionately as the Thud. Laden with bombs, the Thud lost its agility and suffered greatly in the face of communist surface-to-air missiles and fighter pilots. In July 1966, the North Vietnamese downed 43 American aircraft, the highest monthly loss in over a year. In that same summer of 1966, the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing lost 22 pilots and 11 aircraft. The men were frustrated, disheartened, and walking away. Over 1,400 veteran pilots had left the Air Force for the fast-growing commercial aviation sector. But one commander saw what needed to be done and spoke up. He was a committed warrior, a double ace. For years, he had advocated a greater need for aggressive dogfight training. His name was Robin Olds. Basically, the people who were training pilots were more concerned about safety in their own rear ends than proper training. Besides, they didn't know proper training anyway. Youngsters were taught to about all the switches in the cockpit and how to start it, and take off and land, and dropping a few little practice bombs. None of the new fighter pilots were really trained in dogfighting. Robin was about results, and if he had to uh fold, spindle, or mutilate some regulations in order to get the job done, he would do it. On September 30th, 1966, Robin Olds assumed command of the Air Force's 8th Tactical Fighter Wing at Ubon Air Base in Thailand. What he brought was rock star charisma coupled in a powerful, dynamic package that in another era would have been a warrior king. So Robin's personality really is what turned around the 8th Fighter Wing. Colonel Olds will teach the 8th Fighter Wing how to dogfight and get revenge on the MiG-21s. To teach dogfighting, you have to be a dogfighter, and Olds is a pro. In teaching the 8th Fighter Wing, he would draw on a vast reservoir of knowledge learned the hard way decades earlier. Robin Olds cut his dogfighting teeth in World War II in the skies over Germany. August 24, 1944, 22-year-old Captain Robin Olds pilots his P-38 named Scat-3 over Germany. His mission, protect American heavy bombers from Luftwaffe fighters. Olds' flight of four P-38s is on the far left of three squadrons. Between them, they cover nearly 20 miles of sky. On the lookout, Old spots tiny specks at his 11 o'clock. I knew what they were. I knew they were enemy, because there was no, nobody else supposed to be there. It's a swarm of Messerschmitt ME-109 fighters. There must have been 55, at least 55 or 60 109s. Old's three and four planes report in with engine problems from poor fuel quality and lag behind. But Olds and his wingman, B.E. Hollister, pull ahead to investigate. Then, Olds makes an aggressive move. He firewalls his throttle and races towards the Messerschmitts. Olds' wingman faithfully keeps up. Olds is about to do the unthinkable. His two fighters will take on 50 ME-109s. But in the right hands, the twin-engine Lightning is up to the task. The P-38 was a great fighter, fun to fly. With a decent pilot, you could whip anybody down low. 
From its first flight on January 27, 1939, the Lockheed P-38 Lightning is seen as a radical departure from traditional American fighters of the day. It boasts twice the power and almost twice the size of its predecessors. With four 50 caliber machine guns plus a 20 millimeter cannon, the P-38 packs enough firepower to sink a ship. The Germans dubbed the new fighter the Fork-Tailed Devil. The P-38's opponent is the small, nimble Messerschmitt Me 109, a favorite of the Luftwaffe. Over 35,000 are built, more than any fighter in history. The Me 109 is heavily armed with two machine guns and a devastating 30 millimeter cannon. A single hit could shatter Old's P-38. The P-38 is faster, can outturn the Me 109, and is more heavily armed. But the German fighter has its own advantages. It's better in a dive. I could outturn a 109 at the altitudes at which we flew. I couldn't dive with him. If the German aircraft are formidable, so are the men who fly them. The German Air Force is the most experienced in the world. Some pilots, in combat since 1937, have hundreds of kills. You had some superb pilots, so you never knew what you're going to be up against. I never got in two battles that were the same. Olds and his wingman steal even closer, approaching undetected behind the vast German formation. To reduce drag, the P-38s drop their heavy, long-range fuel tanks that they needed to fly this far into Germany. And I told my wingman, B.E. Hollister, tanks. Off went the drops, and we kind of barged ahead. And I lined up on tail end Charlie, and they were just about to shoot, and both engines quit. Startled, Olds realizes that when he dropped his tanks, he forgot to switch over to his internal fuel supply. So what the hell? I shot anyway. And to this day, I claim to be the only fighter pilot in the history of aerial warfare to shoot down an enemy aircraft while in the glide mode. As that first enemy breaks up and tumbles away, Olds restarts his engines and presses his attack into the formation. I know it sounds ridiculous for two guys to attack that many airplanes, but I ask anyone who's listening, put yourself in one of those German airplanes. One of your people screams that he's been hit, he's bailing out. Every man in that huge gaggle would wonder if there was somebody right behind him. The German pilots scatter in panic. The P-38s speed into the formation of 50 enemy planes. Olds' wingman chases after two aircraft. Olds, in a climbing left turn, pursues another Messerschmitt. Then I went on into the fight, got another one. B.E. got two of them up here with one pass. And I looked down and there was a P-51. Where he came from, I have no idea. The American P-51 Mustang is being chased by two ME-109s. Olds breaks into a steep, screaming dive to help the outnumbered Mustang. But in his excitement, Olds dives too fast. Olds pulls and turns his control yoke. SCAT-3 doesn't respond. His P-38 plummets out of control, plunging toward the German countryside. August 23, 1943. Army Air Force Captain Robin Olds dives to help an American P-51 under attack, but he dives too fast. The speed built up in his dive has rendered his flight controls useless. The P-38 is now gripped by an aerodynamic effect known as compressibility. It was a phenomena only beginning to be understood by aircraft engineers and pilots. In the dive, Old's P-38 actually approaches the speed of sound. The air on the leading edge of the wing begins to compress. As the speed increases, a shock wave develops. The airflow over the wings and critical control surfaces is disrupted. The pilot is no longer master of his machine. When the pilot in P-38 was in a dive with compressibility, 
the control surfaces were almost useless and they could pull and yank at it as hard as they could and get almost no reaction. It must have been a terrifying experience. With the loss of control, Olds focuses his attention inside the cockpit. I saw that 51 down there and dove without thinking. So to, to heck with the Germans, all I wanted to do, try to recover, because many had not been able to do so. But as he reaches the denser air at lower altitude, the control surfaces start to respond. He pulls back hard on the P-38's control yoke. I pulled so many Gs that my canopy window broke out, which was horrifying noise. And I know it sounds like an exaggeration, but I managed to pull out right above this wheat field near the town of Rostock. With a shattered canopy, it's time for Olds to call it a day. Now I want to go home. I'm, you know, I've had enough. But a string of tracer fire past his nose brings him back into the fight. And there was a 109 shooting at me. And I quickly turned hard, thinking, this isn't fair. Leave me alone. I'm hurt. All I want to do is go home. Olds has to make a quick decision. He can increase power, pull ahead, and hope to outrun the German. Or he can climb to gain room to maneuver. But a climb could slow him down and give the enemy an easier shot at him. Olds is here in front of the German. Olds goes for the extreme. He flat planes, pulls on the yoke as hard as he can, turns hard left 90 degrees, and shudders into a high-speed stall. It's the air combat equivalent of locking the brakes. But, and with a G-force like that, I slowed down rapidly. He overshot. I rolled the wings level, and he was right in front of me, so I pulled the trigger. Down he went. It's Old's fifth kill. He's officially an ace. By the end of World War II, Captain Robin Olds tallies 12 kills. During his days fighting over Europe, Olds learns lessons and tactics taught by his squadron commander, the legendary Hub Zemke. Zemke focused the men on the basics, but strongly believed an aggressive spirit was the most valuable asset of a fighter pilot. Now, 23 years later in Vietnam, Olds pilots a jet with speeds three times faster than his P-38 and with an arsenal that includes high-tech missiles. His dogfighting skills and leadership will inspire and revitalize the young pilots and instill in them the confidence to wrest control of the skies over North Vietnam. All the guys loved Robin when he got there. And one reason was, he came in and said, this is the way it is. I'm the new guy, but I'm going to give you guys about two weeks, and I'm going to be better than any of you. He pointed to every person in that room. Olds is a maverick and does things his way. He ignores rank and assigns flight leaders by ability. Things changed for the better. It became a fighter wing. His pilots are ready for combat, and Olds has picked the target, the Soviet-built MiG-21s. They're taking their toll on American aircraft, and Olds wants revenge. But to destroy the MiGs, Olds must fight them in the air, engage them, and kill them. He devises one of the most ingenious traps in aerial history. I went to my boss, General Momar, and suggested that the Migs were getting very frisky, as he knew, that I had an idea that we could do something about it. Old's plan is simple. Trick the enemy into thinking that his F-4 Phantom Fighters are the more vulnerable F-105 Thunder Chiefs. When bomb-laden F-105s flew over enemy territory, the Migs came up and engaged the slower, less agile fighter bombers. The North Vietnamese Air Force developed a hit-and-run tactic that's akin to guerrilla tactics, where the MiG-21s would come in at low altitude, pop up and try and hit the F-105 strike forces, but then escape before the F-4s could come down and attack them. 
The reluctance of the MiG pilots to engage didn't mean they lacked courage or skill. The U.S. estimated that the North Vietnamese only had 16 MiG-21s. They were very careful how they used them. Robin Olds and his Phantoms, by flying like F-105s, using the same approaches, radio frequencies, call signs, and flight patterns, hoped to deceive the North Vietnamese radar operators into ordering the MiG-21s to attack the presumably easy prey. Once in the air, the American fighters would cut down the MiGs. Olds names the plan Operation Bolo, after a lethal Filipino fighting knife. But Olds needed one more trick to complete the ruse. The QRC-160 electronic countermeasures pod jammed enemy radars, decreasing the ability of anti-aircraft guns and surface-to-air missiles to find their targets. The pod was always carried by the thuds, but had never been fitted to an F-4. So the North Vietnamese, upon catching their signals, would surely think, well, these are F-105s. It was one more key to the success of Operation Bolo. So in a moment's notice, the F-4s were wired to uh, carry a QRC-160 jamming pod and uh, switches installed in the cockpit to activate them. And they luckily had this pod to make the Operation Bolo work. January 2nd, 1967, phantoms from Ubon Air Base in Thailand roar off the runway. Seven flights of four phantoms each head toward the MiG airfield surrounding Hanoi. The flights, mimicking the call signs usually given to the F-105s, are named for cars. The first is Olds, the second is Ford, the third is Rambler, followed by Lincoln, Tempest, Plymouth, and Vespa. The fighters depart their home base in Thailand in five-minute intervals to maximize their time to engage MiGs over the target area. The first Phantoms to reach the target is Olds' flight, led by Colonel Robin Olds. One MiG has already been shot down, knocked out by Olds' number four man, Walter Redeker. But more MiG-21s burst through the cloud layer below. They realized we were not thuds. And the lead called out, these are not thuds, they're phantoms. What shall we do? Mass confusion. The MiG pilots had been trained to follow orders, not react by instinct. They always had to obey what they were told to do by the ground people. And the ground people were in a tizzy. They didn't know what to do about it. The North Vietnamese have taken the bait. Olds orders his men to attack. Operation Bolo is about to change the air war in Vietnam. January 2nd, 1967. Colonel Robin Olds and the other three F-4 Phantoms of his strike group streak high over the Phuc Yen airfield, emulating a favorite prey of enemy MiGs, the F-105 Thunder Chief. In an elaborate bait-and-switch sting, their F-4 fighters carry an arsenal of weapons built for dogfighting. The radar-guided AIM-7E Sparrow missile can strike targets at over 25 miles away, while the heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinder can accelerate in seconds to a speed of Mach 2.5, over three times faster than most jets. With more bandits scrambling from the airfield below, the dogfights are just heating up. It's time to find out if Olds and his pilots can knock the vaunted MiG-21s out of the sky. First supplied to North Vietnam from Russia in March 1966, the nimble MiG-21 was a vast improvement over the MiG-17 and 19. It had greater speed, higher ceiling, and more advanced weaponry. It could reach speeds of almost 1,400 miles per hour, was armed with a hard-hitting 23-millimeter cannon and two K-13A Atoll heat-seeking missiles, a Soviet copy of the American AIM Sidewinder. MiG-21 at altitude was better than F-4. If you can get him down low and in a churning battle, he loses energy in high G turns. So you could battle them down low dogfight, if you will. 
But uh, up high, uh, forget it. The MiG's opponent is the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom, which entered service in 1960 with the U.S. Navy. The Phantom's two turbojet engines deliver a top speed of nearly 1,500 miles per hour. It could strike targets out to 1,200 miles without refueling. Though formidable, it was designed to intercept enemy bombers with missiles not dogfight. The weaknesses of the F-4 were it didn't have a gun. Uh, the MiGs were real good at employing their gun. The MiG is more agile than the Phantom above 20,000 feet. It's smaller, harder to spot, and has the important advantage of a gun. But down low, the more powerful Phantom can outturn the MiG-21. The F-4 is faster and has a better rate of climb. It carries a greater number of missiles. The MiG-21s that rise and strike at the masquerading Phantoms on January 2nd are no easy prey. The MiG pilots, to their credit, were very aggressive, most of them. And it was a great opportunity for us to uh, test our skills. Old spots another MiG at 11 o'clock. He breaks left and zeroes in for an easy kill. Olds fires two Sparrow missiles. But the missiles lose radar lock and tear past the MiG. Olds sticks with him and fires a heat-seeking AIM-9 Sidewinder missile. But the MiG breaks hard, shakes the missile lock, then dives for cover in the clouds. But as fast as one vanishes, another appears. Then there was another MiG going uh, 180 degrees to me, fairly close. So close that I couldn't just make a flat turn and get behind him. Olds must accomplish two things. First, he must reverse his direction and get on the MiG's tail. Second, he must create enough distance between himself and the MiG to gain a missile lock. Olds uses a classic dogfighting maneuver he learned in World War II, the vector roll. I went straight up. When I got up, 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 I turned over on my back and hung there for a moment or two, well, a few seconds and watched it. And when the time was right, I rolled to my right. Now, he was down to my left so that this roll would take me in a wide, swooping, downward curve, and I wound up right behind him. Olds exploits the Phantom's powerful thrust and soars above the MiG. To counter the mind-numbing Gs, Olds G-suit inflates, squeezing his calves, thighs, and stomach to keep blood in his brain and prevent a gray out. I don't think that MiG saw me, no. The one that was going opposite my direction. If he did, he was stupid. Olds, now in perfect position, his range only 4,500 feet, arms his sidewinder. When I came down behind him, I got a wonderful growl. The sidewinder looks at the IR signature of an airplane, the heat, heat wave, and it speaks to you. It, uh, it kind of mumbles. Then if it sees a good heat source, it goes then you know that your missile is looking at the target. So it's very simple. All you have to do is pull the trigger. The doomed pilot doesn't eject. Olds has shot down one MiG, but can't stay for more. His number four Phantom, flown by Captain Rediger, is in trouble. One of his tanks didn't feed. I had plenty of fuel. I could have stayed there, but I, I wanted to get him home. Olds streaks out of the combat zone and escorts Radiker to safety. In less than five minutes, Colonel Robin Olds and his flight have downed three MiGs with no losses.
The second wave of four phantoms, Ford Flight, screams in. Operation Bolo has suckered the MiGs into a fight. The deception has done its part. Now the outcome is in the hands of Old's pilots. January 2nd, 1967, over Fukien Airfield near Hanoi. Ford Flight, the second wave of Operation Bolo, engages the enemy. Captain Everett Raspberry, an experienced combat instructor, flies Ford 3. He spots four SA-2 surface-to-air missiles hurtling through the clouds at their 4 o'clock. The SA-2 has a top speed of Mach 3.5, over 2,660 miles per hour. This missile can obliterate jets at 60,000 feet. But the Phantoms are carrying the QRC-160 electronic countermeasures pod. The pod, originally mounted on the Phantoms to create a more convincing F-105, now gives Raspberry a lucky break. It jams the enemy radar. The missiles pass to the rear, below the Phantoms, and don't detonate. Meanwhile, the MiGs, now realizing they've been suckered into facing swarms of well-armed F-4 Phantoms, are forced into a fight. Some of them are more aggressive than others. It was hit and miss. Others seemed to want to hang around and fight. And uh, I think that was the kind we were really looking for. <laughs> because it was hard to catch these guys. A MiG is closing on Colonel Chappie James, the Ford leader. Raspberry spots him. I thought he was coming after our lead. He kept closing too close. So I tried to get the Ford lead to break to the right three or four times and he wouldn't go. So I got between him and the MiG. The MiG is coming up from James four o'clock. When James doesn't break right, Raspberry accelerates to intercept the MiG. The MiG pilot overshoots Ford 1 and snaps into a high-G left turn to avoid a fight. Raspberry breaks left behind the MiG, but he's pulling too many Gs on his aircraft in order for his missiles to function properly. Raspberry executes a vector roll. Raspberry pulls out of the vector roll on the MiG-6. He's 3,500 feet behind the MiG in a left turn, the perfect position to fire a Sidewinder missile. Raspberry has to make this shot count. He has just one working Sidewinder. He closes in on the MiG's tail. I followed the guy down. He was heading for the clouds. The MiG, focused on getting into the safety of the clouds, makes a frantic dash. But just before hitting the low cloud cover, he inexplicably reverses his turn. It's a fatal mistake. Raspberry now has a perfect shot. I had the, the tone in the headset for the missile, which told you it was tracking. Squeeze the trigger, and it went like a bullet right in the cockpit with him, and then he blew up. I almost spun in while I was watching him. It was so spectacular. The first time I'd ever had shot down a MiG. And uh, so I was excited, to say the least. Ford Flight has scored a kill, the fourth Bolo victory so far, and suffered no losses. Ford Flight exits the target area as the third wave, Rambler Group, streaks in with missiles ready. Old's trap is working spectacularly. MiGs fill the skies. But Rambler Group faces an added danger. More telephone pole-sized SA-2 SAMs streak through the clouds. Rambler is led by Captain John B. Stone, one of the main planners of Operation Bolo. You got your brain, your heart, your gut, and your hand interconnected. And that's what it takes to pull off the mission. You're going to be scared. You're going to be nervous. You're going to be sweating. Your voice is going to go up a few octaves, probably. First time the SAMs come up. 
but that's what gets the ticker going to make it work. Stone hears the fight ahead on his radio. Concerned about attacking friendly fighters beyond visual range, Stone radios Olds to get a fix on his position. I could hear it all going on, and that's when I'd ask, uh, where are you? The response was, go find your own. <laughs> I thought that was pretty uh, selfish of him at the time, but <laughs> there's plenty left. <laughs> it didn't take Stone long to find his own. I looked out ahead and I saw two bigs. Later I find out there were four. I just saw the two. They were about my two o'clock position. I was high on them, maybe two to three miles out. Stone drops his fuel tanks. Then he and his wingman break right and go into a hard dive, keeping their eyes on the nearest MiG. I'd holler, go foresight, which trains my radar to look where my pipper and my windscreen is. In going boresight, the pipper, visible on the Phantom's windscreen, acts like a gun sight, allowing the pilot to aim his weapons by eye. Stone puts the pipper at the wing root of the trailing MiG. The radar locks, and he fires a Sparrow missile. But it's a dud. The Sparrow, designed to follow the Phantom's radar beam to the target, has major reliability problems in Vietnam's tropical weather. Since the reliability of the Sparrow was in the range of 10% or so, pilots would typically ripple fire them so that they would hope that one would find its way to the target. I fired two more times. The second one went right to the wing root of the MiG-21 and exploded. and the guy ejected. Then, Stone and his wingman spot two more MiGs, high and above. They were shiny, bright, shiny, silver ones. So I turned to avoid those two. Suddenly, a blur of polished silver shoots between Stone and his wingman. You know, I just saw it peripherally. Find out later it was a MiG-21 that came through between my number two and I, and he was shooting. I didn't even see this. I was glad. I'm sure it would have scared me to death. Stone gets an urgent radio call. I hear this voice. He's Rambler 3. Said, and it's a MiG on your ass, break right. Stone looks to his right and sees nothing, then to his left and sees a MiG 1,200 feet away. It's 30 millimeter cannons blazing right at him. Air Force Captain J.B. Stone, one of the masterminds of Operation Bolo, spots an enemy MiG-21 coming up from behind with cannons blazing. Tracers were red basketballs about this big all over my canopy. Stone breaks hard left to get out of the MiG's crosshairs. And I hollered nice expletive and broke into him to defeat this turn. The MiG, going too fast to match Stone's turn, overshoots. Stone seizes the advantage, rolls right, and reverses his turn. In the high G turn, he fights to keep his head up and his eyes on the target. Stone expects to see the MiG right in front of him. The MiG's not there. I don't see number two. So I start another turn, and I'm in this hard turn. I light the burners. Stone's lost sight of his wingman and the enemy MiG, a potentially fatal mistake. He rolls out of the turn and searches the sky. Then he spots his wingman engaging one of the MiGs. When I broke this way, he couldn't recover, but he did a high G barrel roll, and he saw the ones that I was looking at a few minutes before. Lawrence Glenn, his wingman, does a perfect barrel roll. He noses up, rolls right, goes inverted, and rolls back down behind the MiG. The move has widened the distance between Glenn and the MiG, allowing him to gain a missile lock. 
Lynn fires a sparrow. Philip Combe's flying Rambler 4 goes after two more MiGs. Phil Combe's had picked up those other two MiGs that I had not seen the first time. And uh, he had a little engagement with them, and he shot down one out of that flight. Stone finds no targets in sight. Then, SAM missiles rocket up through the low clouds. I called egress, meaning, let's go, let's get the hell out of here. We got everybody together. It was time to go. Rambler flight turns back toward home base in Thailand. They've engaged six MiGs, obliterating three. The four remaining Bolo flights arrive too late for action. The MiGs have cut and run. The heavy undercast masks their escape. I found out later that for all the talking with the MiGs and their controllers on the ground, told them, get in the clouds. And that's what happened. All the MiGs went into the clouds, and it was all over. Back at Ubon Air Base, the ground crews eagerly await the Phantom's return. Those guys on the ground now see the results, and when the uh, canopies come open and people start holding up one and two fingers indicating MiG kills, the place erupts. It's a party. Olds and his men have won a huge victory. In just 13 minutes, they downed seven MiGs. Operation Bolo shot down seven MiG-21s, which may not seem very high, but to put it in perspective, the North Vietnamese Air Force only had about 12 to 16 MiG-21s at the time, so they lost about half their MiG-21 force. It's the highest kill total of any mission in the Vietnam War so far, with no American losses. But the results reach much wider than the destruction of so many of the enemy's prized MiG-21s. From the wider perspective of the air war as a whole, it forced the North Vietnamese to pull back, regroup, kind of scratch their heads and figure what in the world happened today and how do we prevent that from happening again. It kind of put a damper on the MiG activities for quite a while, for quite a while. But the main thing I think that Bolo did was, it was uh, exhilarating for all fighter pilots that we finally got to do something. In this rarely seen interview, shortly after the battle, Colonel Olds sums up Operation Bolo. Deliberately planned fighter sweep went just as we'd hoped. The MiGs came up, the MiGs were aggressive, we tangled, they lost. Olds receives his third Silver Star. During his tour in Vietnam, Olds downs three more MiGs. With a total of 17 kills, 13 in World War II, and four in Vietnam, he becomes a triple ace, one of the greatest commanders and fighter pilots the Air Force has known. No two engagements, which I really prefer to call them, are the same, ever. You think you got it down pat, but it's always something different. It's always something that will surprise you or demand of you flexibility, innovation. The training and the teamwork that Olds instilled in his fighter wing turned them into the premier MiG-killing outfit in the Vietnam War, with a wartime total of 38 aerial kills. Olds was promoted to Brigadier General in May 1968 and retired from the Air Force in 1973. Thanks to outspoken combat veterans like Robin Olds, who relentlessly stressed the fundamentals, the Air Force relearned and mastered the art of the dogfight.